goodness. Let me just begin by saying how much do we love these guys? Thank you. Who else is on the edge of their seat this morning to hear the stories they're about to share? Um, I am very excited about this. And um, I guess just to kind of set the tone for today, last week we began our month's series called This Is My Story. And this month we just really wanted to give the focus over to thinking about the power of our stories and also to spend some time equipping each other as the body of Christ um, to really feel empowered to share our stories, both amongst ourselves as a church community, but also with the world around us. And um, so the next three today and the next following two Sundays, we're going to be hearing some incredible stories. Um, And we're starting today with Rita and CJ, who we love so, so much. And um, yeah, we just pray that what we're going to talk about this morning really inspires you in your personal faith with Jesus, but also equips you and encourages you um, as we think about the power of our stories, which is amazing. So... I feel like we've got my own talk show. This is why I did this series, really, just so I could feel like a talk show host. A talk show host. But um, it's great. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Thank you. And I guess we just we thought we would start with the most important question, the story we all love to hear. I wonder if you could both take a few moments to share with us your stories of coming to faith in Jesus for the first time. I don't know who wants to go first. I'll let you decide that between yourselves, but you go, first. go for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, growing up, I was brought up in a Christian home. My mom was my role model. She taught me to read the Bible. She taught me the love of God, but I never really encountered the love of God um, because I... What I was doing, I was doing it for mommy, not because of what I feel, not because of what I understood. Until I left home, I left mom, then went to secondary school. A minister was invited to the school to pray. It was more like a revival happening that day. So I don't know, that day, I don't know what he was actually praying for, but I felt the love of God for the first time. It was like heavy. I can't explain it. Wow, yeah. I can't describe it. Wow. I just felt the love. I started crying, and that was when I realized that I have to give my life to Christ Mm. for me. Wow. Yeah. Wow, so it's that really tangible sense of God's presence. Yeah. And you're realizing, Jesus, you're real. Yeah. And I have to respond. So powerful. Yeah, amazing. What about yourself, CJ? Well, um, I, I feel I should just copy and paste because <laughs> <laughs> it's a similar um, situation. Yeah, yeah. I, I was born into a Christian home also. Mm-hmm. So right from early age, just like Ezra, mm-hmm. there was Sunday school. There were people around that, was, that were always talking about God and Jesus and all that. But um, something happened in my family. I lost my dad when I was young. And he had this vision of giving his kids um, a very good life, quality education, a good relationship with God and all that. So he died while I was young. And my mom was too heartbroken. But she tried her best to leave that vision. So um, she made it like mandatory for us all to have a study, word study, and all that. But even with all that, um, there was still no proper connection with Christ until I grew up and went to secondary school. Meanwhile, um, I had my grandfather who was like, he was a minister. So um, every holiday, I would pop in, you know, go visit him, pop into his room. I had free access to his room anyway. So I could just run in, and sometimes I would meet him praying, you know, the atmosphere the presence of the Holy Spirit. I didn't know what it was then, but that kept me wondering, what was it that he had? So I wanted to experience that, and it didn't happen until secondary school, right? So um, just like history, um, it was morning devotion. My school had invited this minister to come, a young guy. He just graduated then. 
So he came and preached from from First Samuel, and he spoke about um, you should have a walk with God, and the power was God, power of God was so present, and I gave my life to Christ for the first time. That was in 1994. Whoa, 1994? No way. Yep. No way. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping your rage away there, CJ. <laughs> uh, gosh, thank you for sharing that, guys. And just, I think it's so. When you hear stories like yours, to encourage all the Christian families or Christian parents, how encouraging is it to know the the seeds that have been sown? At some point, they will bear fruit. Yeah. And um, I know for myself, I became I grew up in a Christian family, but still having to come to that moment of choosing faith. Yeah. Um, and just to say, never underestimate the seeds that you're sowing. Never <laughs> underestimate um, the power of sharing the word of God in your home and I love I love that I love that for you guys you. and um, I've snuck this cheeky question in right because I've heard this story before and it's just brilliant okay. right. but I'm sure everyone in the room as well as knowing how you came to faith would love to know how did you meet how did you guys get together because okay. God's <laughs> really in that story isn't he yeah 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 Who's feeling the romance? Who's going to share the story? (laughs) Okay. Uh, I feel I've been set up. (laughs) Okay, so how did we meet? Um, Well, there's a whole lot around it. Okay. um, We'll come back next week. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So how we met. um, Okay, let's talk about how we met. And then we'll talk about how we got to, um, how we eventually got to know we were getting married to each other. So um, we met in 2009. Um, I, I got a job. Um, I left Lagos. That was in Nigeria. And, and moved to Abuja. It was, Abuja is the capital city of Nigeria. So it was a northern part. I couldn't speak the language. I didn't know much. So um, when I got to Abuja, um, the office that employed us, it was a telecom company, so they had staff bosses and all that. And the boss would pick you, and there were different bosses for different routes for people that stay you know, around the, the city. So in my own part of the city, we, we built a very good rapport with our bus driver. Uh, it, it's like um, a 32-seater bus, and everybody had a favorite seat. So I had my seat right behind the driver. Yeah. So, <laughs> And one day after work... Um, I got into the bus and someone sat on my seat. So I walked up to her and I go, hi, how are you? And she had earpiece, so initially she didn't answer. (laughs) And after like a long while, she looked up and then removed the earpiece and she goes, hi. So I'm like, okay, can I share this seat with you at least? It's my seat. So (laughs) So she made a space and I sat beside her. And we just got talking. I'm like, okay, so how are you? Um, all through the journey, it was like um, 30 to 40 minutes ride around town, dropping people at their houses and all that. All she spoke about was her brothers. My brothers, I have younger <laughs> brothers, my brothers. My bro- I'm like, oh my God. I'm trying to get to know someone. And she's just telling me all about her brothers. <laughs> Nothing about herself. Okay. So I got to my stop and got off the bus. I was, as I was going off the bus, I turned back and I saw she also turned and was staring and I'm like, Whoa. okay. Well. <laughs> okay. I can't All right. <laughs> Now, <laughs> but at that point, um, marriage was not on my mind because um, I had tried to start two relationships which didn't work out and I made up my mind not to speak to anybody about marriage ever again until I feel led by God to do so. So um, I know it it looks a bit um, extreme, you know, saying that you're trusting God to lead you to meet your life partner. But um, that was my stand at that point, 2009. So eventually, and interestingly, she also came out of a heartbreak at that time. So uh, according to her, she said she was not going to get married again. So marriage was off her... uh, in fact, she was just so mean, so straightforward. If I meet her at work, after that day, we kept on bumping into each other. Hey, hi, Rita. How are you doing? I'm good. How's it day? It's okay. All right. <laughs> so eventually, um, well, 
uh, we had this program in church. I, I attended House on the Rock then in Abuja. And um, there's this program the, the church holds every year. It's called Jam Mega Festival. Jam means Jesus and me. It's a praise program um, where the pastor would invite different worshipers from different parts of the world. And I was in the evangelism unit then. So um, at the end of the worship night, there will be an altar call and people would give their life to Christ. So we will be on ground to like lead them to Christ and then plan a follow up thereafter. So we were praying towards the program. It was a Thursday and I went to church to pray for jam. I was not thinking about marriage. While I was praying, I heard a voice in my heart that said, Rita Swatchett, Swatchett is our middle name. Rita Swatchett is your wife. Wow. I stopped praying. I, <laughs> I looked around. Everybody in the church, they were all praying in tongues, praying for souls. And I'm like, ah, I should be praying for souls. And I'm thinking about, <laughs> I'm thinking about Rita. And so um, when I knew, that was how I knew she was the one. After that, I became more intentional, more deliberate, yeah. started calling frequently, started visiting regularly. Yeah. But she didn't like that. <laughs> so one day, she made up her mind to come warn me. So she called me and said she was coming to my house. I'm like, oh, finally, the queen is coming. I cleaned up, cleaned up my room, got everything neat and w waited for her. She came and um, her intention was to come caution me to say, hey, you're getting too close. Stay away. And she got to my house. And then that same voice came again. This is your chance. Speak. So I just asked, will you marry me? I didn't ask her out. Whoa. We didn't date. Whoa. And after another forever silence, it was a yes. Oh, amazing. Let's have a round of applause for that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so think about who you sit next to on the bus, guys. All the single people. <laughs> beautiful. Beautiful. Well, one of the reasons I asked you to share that story, number one, I just think it's brilliant, but I just love the way that the voice of God is so clearly woven into your guys' life. And um, yeah, even in you guys coming together, just that, that sense of prayer, that sense of seeking God and hearing God um, is clearly such a significant part of your journey of faith. And so I just wanted to kind of change gear slightly and turn the conversation to prayer. Um, and... Um, yeah, I guess in knowing you both for, gosh, surely 18 months, maybe more. I don't know. The time is flying by. But what I've witnessed in you is such a depth and um, sense of power in your prayer lives and also the significance of prayer in your stories. And I just wondered if you could spend some time just sharing some stories of your experience um, with prayer. I know that question's really broad, so take it wherever you like. Um, but yeah, let's have story time um, in terms of some of your experiences and encounters with Jesus through prayer specifically. You want to go first? <laughs> um, for me then, um, before I came to know Christ, prayer was something like a routine. In the morning, pray. At night, before you go to bed, pray. So when I come to know Jesus and I felt that love, there was this intentional desire to know him more. There was this, you know, I just wanted to be in his presence. At that moment, it was a kind of difficult because there are other routines that normally stop me from doing that. I felt, okay, I have to position myself in a way that I will be able to talk to God and all that. So, at first, it was an intentional act. I walked towards it. I'll be like, I have to pray for this. I have to pray. I started praying 12 midnight. I wake up 12 midnight and pray and all that. Then, after a while, it became something that has to do with me. I just talk to God always. It's more like food. I eat it like food, like if I'm walking on the street, if I'm bathing, if I'm cooking, I just keep talking to him continuously. Then when I met Chijoke, 
he said I shouldn't be calling that name. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's his full name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I met CJ, um, it was a different dimension. He taught me um, a different angle to prayer, like praying for the things we want, praying for for every single thing. For instance, if we buy a cup, even if it's a cup, we pray about it. We'll be like, God, bless this cup. We celebrate it and we'll be like, Father, Lord, bless. thank you for this cup. Bless it. Let it last. Let it not break. Blah, <laughs> blah, 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 and all that. I'll be like, wow. Yeah, yeah. How, then we started praying about um, territories. Like if we, if we get a new job, what we do first, we we'll a kind of pray about the the job we find ourselves will be like um father lord we commit this job into your hands help us oh lord to be what you want us to be help your us so that your will will be done in our lives so that whatever will be there we do here will be your purpose not ours and all that so he taught me that gradually i got to learn that dimension of prayer Beautiful. Powerful. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Okay, um, just to add to what she has shared. Yeah. Um, well, for for me, um, I see prayer as not just a moment of asking for things from God, but it's actually like a moment to get to know God the more, mm, to spend time in His presence, yeah, yeah. to connect with Him, um, to be led by Him. The best person that could speak about anything should be the person that made it. This mic, the guy that made this mic, made a manual. If you read the manual, you would know the right angle to keep it, where to hold, where to turn it on, where to turn it off. And that's how um, prayer is. It's like a manual. It helps you connect to God, and he gives you specific instruction about your life, about what he wants you to do in life. When I met her, I used to have a list. You know, I told you I, I, I tried to start two relationships because I used to have a list of what I want in my wife. But after my relationships failed, the two of them, I discarded my list. And when I met her, it was like getting to discover the beauty of her relationship with God. I'm the kind of person that would go around the house, pray in tongues, have my pen and paper with me, waiting for God to speak. She doesn't struggle to hear God. She would just shut her eyes and sleep and get a clear picture from God about what's going to happen. It has happened over and over again. So her dreams are so powerful. Let me share a story that happened recently, um, two months ago. Uh, this is June. That was in April, right? April. Um, she saw a dream. Armstrong was riding a bike. Armstrong is her younger brother. Brothers again. Armstrong was, Armstrong was riding a bike and Armstrong crashed and died. So she woke up, and because we've known that her dreams are the ways that God gives her clear pictures of things that would happen, especially in our lives, we, we prayed about it. We called Armstrong, and then he goes, oh, yeah, I, I actually have a plan of getting a bike, but don't bother. I won't ride it. I want to give it out. It's like a business. I want to give it out to delivery guys and make money. So we prayed about the spirit of death and all that. Fast forward, first week of June. Okay, yeah, so in May, Armstrong actually bought a bike and didn't tell us. Okay. And then first week of June, Armstrong had an accident riding his bike. And he was on, the, on one of the busiest axes um, on the Lekki Expressway in Lagos. It's a very busy road. It was uh, terrible. It was serious. The, the, the tires rolled off. And guess what? He had Shedrach, his elder brother, you know, as like he was carrying a pillion like a passenger. So he crashed. And that was when they now called us from Nigeria to say, oh, that dream you saw, that prayer, thank God, God spared our lives. And we were like, you guys are stubborn. But that's just, <laughs> <laughs> that's one angle. You know, yeah. there's hardly anything that happens without God revealing to her through dreams or probably speaking yeah. to me. And that has helped our prayer life a lot. Wow, amazing. Gosh. So powerful um, and so real. And I, I just want to pick up on what you said for a second there, Rita, about your journey of growing in prayer, turned from it kind of being a routine, like at set times of the day, to becoming like a way of 
a way of life, just like um, when Paul talks about prayer without ceasing, for me, that's kind of what springs to mind. Like you read that scripture and you think, Paul just wants us to drop everything and pray all the time. That seems like a little bit unreasonable. But actually, the way you're talking about there, where you are bringing absolutely everything before the Lord, um, just in natural conversation, just in the same way that if you were in the shop with a friend and you're talking about what you're going to buy, or the same way that you're walking on the beach with a friend and you're talking about something that you're going through, it's like God is there and God is wanting to engage with us in that way, which is beautiful. Um, So I just want to ask you guys, obviously, Rita, we've heard a little bit of your story about how you learn to pray. Um, But yeah, I'd love to ask you both, how did you learn to pray? I know for some people it can be quite daunting. I remember growing up in church and I remember making that decision to follow Jesus when I was 13 years old. And I got taken to the side of like the youth event that I was at. It was like, great, you've made this decision. Here's a Bible. Go away and read it and pray off you go. There was no kind of um, instructions. um, And it's obviously something we've all had our own individual journeys in exploring. But Rita, perhaps you want to share a little bit more on your journey of that. But how did you guys learn to pray? Um, And how have you then grown in your prayer life throughout your walk with Jesus? Okay. um, Like CJ always says, I always talk about my brothers. Mm. Because, (laughs) okay, um, let me clear that aspect. Growing up, I was like a mother to them. Even though our age difference is not that much, the gap is not that much, but I took that responsibility out of love. Mm. I just loved them. So in that process, as I was growing up, even though I had not given my life to Christ, I had this thing that I normally tell myself. I'll be, lo- I'll be like, Father, Lord, help me. Since I'm the first, mm-hmm. I believe that every step I take, they are watching me. Mm-hmm. So I want them to take the right step in life. I don't want them to make mistakes. So I was very careful. Then I didn't know that it's not about what I do. Mm-hmm. It's not about me. It has to do with the grace of God. Then it was more of like human, you know, what would I call it? Human um, effort, Effort. that's the word. It was more like human effort. I'll be like, more like the law. Thou shall not do this. (laughs) I was that kind of person. To the extent that even if they do something, I'll be like, I'll report you to God. (laughs) 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 Then, Then, um... Later, when I come to fall in love with Jesus, I realize that it's not about the way I live my life. It's not how right I am or how wrong I am. It's just by his grace. So I came in time with, how can somebody love me this much? Who am I that he will lay down his life for me? You know? That's so deep. How can somebody love that? Whenever I think about it, I break down and cry like, how can somebody love me that much that he can lay down his life for me? Then there was this preacher preaching something about Jesus. He was talking about when Jesus was struggling with his mission. That was um, when he cried out to God, he said, Father, take this cross away because it was so heavy for him. That's to tell you that even Jesus Christ felt pain at that moment. But later on, he said, "Not let not my will be done, but yours. So because of that, I began to learn how to pray. I want to be like Jesus. I kept saying, I want to be like you. I want to love selflessly. I want a situation whereby anything I do, I, I think about you. Anything I do, I put you first. That was how I started. Then that intentional prayer came in. It, then gradually, sometimes I find it difficult to ask. CJ, even CJ 
normally tell me, why do you find it difficult to ask? But I don't know why, because I felt, I used to feel God has done too much for me, for him to lay down my, his life for me. That means he has given me everything. Why should I ask? So it was more like, I want to know you. I want to hear you more. I want to understand you. So that was how I learned to pray. Wow. So it's like encounter yeah. with the love of God led you to a place of pursuing Jesus every chance you got. So it wasn't so much a, oh, this is a thing that I do and tick off the list. This is like an urgent hunger that I have to be with Jesus. I have to know who he is. I'm going to get you to pray for us for that at the end in a few moments in when we finish at the end. Cause I think it's so easy for our hearts, our lives to get full and it, it blocks us. Like we can get blinkered to the full beauty of who Jesus is and what he's done. And... I think there's something so significant and beautiful about just that pure spirit of desire for Jesus that um, even as you're speaking, I'm like, Lord, creating me a pure heart. I want to hunger after you. I want to seek you. I want to encounter the full full beauty of who you are. So I'm going to get you to pray for us for that in a few moments when, when, when we finish the conversation. But what about yourself, CJ? How did you learn to pray? Um, well, I learned to pray, um, like I said, by grow, grow, growing up, right? There were people around that were always there to pray. My mom, her relationship with God was good. My grandfather was a healing minister. There was hardly anything he prayed for that didn't happen. I, I saw him lay hands on people and they got healed. He prayed for me and and um, if I'm sick, I go to him, he'll pray for me, he'll lay hands and I get healed and all that. So that drove me to the place of prayer. But growing in prayer is like, um, let me paint a scenario that everybody can relate to. It's like going to the Roca Beach, right? If you get to Roca Beach, um, the first thing that happens is that you wet your feet. So that's like when you've given your life to Christ, um, you've prayed the prayer of salvation. That's more like the first prayer that most people pray, right? Yeah. So you feel the sensation. After a while, the water gets to your ankle. At that point, you're beginning to talk to God more. You're getting small results. You're excited about the results. You want to pray more. Then after a while, it gets to your knee. That's when you begin to learn the keys you know, of the kingdom, because there are keys that could give you access. You learn about faith, you learn about hope, you learn about trust and joy. You begin to pray more confidently, and after a while, it gets to your waist. Yeah. At that time, um, it becomes like something you long for. You want to spend more time yeah. so that you could have that good relationship with God. Um, you begin to pray in tongues, and then God begins to reveal things to you. If you remember at the Roca Beach, after a while, the waves will come. Yeah. So those, like, those are like encounters <laughs> you have. Mm -hmm. You probably, while praying, he would show you something, and you're like, oh, I want to see that again. Mm -hmm. Or he would give you a word from the scripture, and that's how you develop hearing from God while praying. Mm -hmm. At that time, you've gone past the level of asking, seeking, knocking, give me this, give me that. It becomes more like, I want more of you, God. I want more of you. Um, what, what is your plan for my life? After a while, the water covers you. And that's the hallmark of prayer. When you get to a place where God begins to partner with you. It's just like in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 1. Where the scripture says, um, the prophet Habakkuk said, I will take my stand upon my watch and I will wait to see what he will say. Um, if you look at it, it's not an error. He wants to see what God will say. I know we all hear what people say, but when you get to the stage where you want to see what God is saying, that's a revelation. Um, John got to that stage and Jesus told him, come up higher. And Jesus gave him a revelation of what's going to happen. At that level of prayer, you're no longer seeking things around you. You're partnering with heaven to yeah. birth God's purpose on earth. Yeah. Abraham got to that stage, mm -hmm. and when God was about to destroy Sodom, God came to him, hey, I'm going to destroy that city. And do you know why God told him? Mm -hmm. 
because he had grown in a place of prayer to the stage where he could negotiate with God. Hey, if you find 50 people, are you going to spare the city? Yeah. Sodom, the entire Sodom didn't know what was happening. They were being judged. And one man was standing in the gap for them. He negotiated with God. If you find 35 people, will you spare the city? If you find 20 people, if you get to a stage where God reveals things to you before they happen, it means you're, you're, you're like a stakeholder. He partners with you to birth his will on earth. And that's the hallmark. Then I'd like to do another scripture. Um, James chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. It says, the effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous avail it much, right? Who is the righteous? Um, if you read that scripture, the first thing that will come to your mind is the righteous is the guy that is not living in sin, that is doing right and all that and stands. No, righteousness is, that is not righteousness. That is self-righteousness, which morally speaking is not bad. But that scripture is referring to the righteous, the one um, whose Jesus has died for and who knows that, right? Um, we are the righteousness of God in Christ. If you get to know that you are that person in that scripture, remove the righteous and put your name. Yeah. The effectual fervent prayer of CJ, yeah. avail it much. Yeah. Effectual fervent prayer of Rita, avail it much. And um, the Amplified Version says, it makes tremendous power available that is dynamic in its working. <clears throat> that will blow your mind as a child of God. Yeah. So that's how I grew in prayer. Yeah, amazing. And... It's almost like I love the image that you give of walking into the sea because it's like God is so faithful to um, he do, he'll do what he says. So he, God's not holding anything back yeah. um, from us, but he's always extending that invitation to us to step further in. Yeah. And but it's like that dynamic, as you say, between. God's invitation and then as we respond he responds and there's another invitation yeah. and it's this like lifelong process yeah. of discovery and occupying um the the authority and the place of relationship that Jesus has won for us which is just so so powerful um and what you guys are sharing this morning is just like, I don't know if you were aware, but you could hear a pin drop in this room because we all, we're all just like loving the stories that you're sharing. Um, I do think um, one of my personal convictions when we talk about prayer um, and answered prayer, I think it's also really important that we also talk about unanswered prayer. Yeah. Um, in as much as our experience and our hope is that God will answer prayer, um, I'm sure we've all got long lists of prayer that prayers that we've prayed that haven't come to pass. Yeah. Um, so what have you learned about God whilst waiting for prayers to be answered, would you say? Mm. In that unanswered season. You want to go first? Okay. Yeah. Um, for an unanswered prayer is deep. Mm. What we've learned so far, I and CJ. If you are going to God to ask for something, is either a yes, he'll tell you a yes, or a no, or a wait. Yeah. Those are the three ways he answers prayers. So for a yes, you know, anything you ask, you use the Bible, you quote the scripture, ask, seek, knock, all you'll be given everything, you fill the whole world is yours so whenever he answer there's this joy you know you ask for anything in his name and you get it done then you move to a no a no can either be you are praying a mist not in accordance to the will of god and it's a no it's a no 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 or it can be a redirection is either what you feel is good for you is not actually what God wants for you. He has a purpose for you. Or is either he has seen that where you're heading to is going to hurt you. So it will be a redirection. 
Like um, growing up, I wanted to be a chemical engineer. I read chemical engineering. Um, I wanted to work in a refinery and all that. I had my dream planned out. But <laughs> later on, when I tried to get, even I got promises from humans and I was so sure that I would get that job. Then when the time came, I was disappointed. That was my first no right. from yeah. God. Wow. I cried and cried. At the same time, I had a relationship with someone. Not that I didn't pray about it. Mm. I prayed about it, but I felt, you know, he was my best friend then. Mm. So I felt, oh, he's a born again. He loves God. Okay, this is the person. So I had this relationship with God. I told God that um, I don't want to date someone that I will not marry. Mm. I don't want to court someone that I will not marry. Mm. So I made that promise actually to God. So in the process, when I got hot, mm. it was very painful. I didn't understand the meaning of redirection. So the same period, I got a no for the job I wanted, a no for the relationship I wanted. Then because of that pain, I had to leave where I was staying, my comfort zone. I moved to Lagos in search of a job. In the process, I got a job in Abuja where I met CJ. At the same time, I felt he redirected me to meet CJ which is my right husband, then he used I and CJ with the jobs that we had then to um, create opportunity for lots of people then back home. We were able, God positioned us in a place where we were able to give them hope, we were able to give them jobs and all that. So that's a redirection. Looking back now, I can look back and smile and laugh over it because I know he redirected me. I didn't mean I took that part. He didn't want me to. It would have been a different story. So there's no regret. Mm -hmm. Then the deepest one that comes with pain mm -hmm. is the weight. Yeah. Everybody has a pain area. Everybody has something that you go to God, you keep asking and asking and asking. You know that it's definitely a yes, because the Bible promised you so. It's his promises, is underlined, it's something that comes with you, with you being in Christ. He has given it to you already, but it's just a weight. And a weight could be, he'll tell you, wait, because I have a purpose I want to fulfill in your life. Mm -hmm. He could say, wait, because I want to use you to glorify myself. Mm -hmm. Then he could say, wait, because we are all called to serve. Mm -hmm. We are all called to service. Mm -hmm. So in that process, I got to learn something because there was something we have always wanted, I and CJ, for 12 years. What we normally do every end of the year, we retreat. We travel somewhere and we have a prayer, like a prayer meeting, just the two of us. Then we have a time with God. We try to listen to God and ask him, what will you want us to do into the next year? Apart from that, you know, we ask, we'll be like, okay, this is our list. Every year, end of the year, we get to check everything on that box, except one. Gradually, it became a pain area because, you know, um, when you wait and wait for too long, the heart becomes weary. Yeah. And at that point, the devil will want to capitalize on fear, on doubt. Then you start doubting yourself. You start telling yourself, God, what am I doing wrong? Am I no longer that child you love so much? Remember, you've been feeling his love so 
deep. But at that point, you can't feel that love anymore because devil will keep reminding you, you see, you don't have this and you call yourself a child of God. And when I say devil, devil can come in form of human beings to torment you. He will send people your way that will tell you, you say you love Jesus. People will come to you and tell you things like, are you sure you truly love Jesus? Or are you sure you are actually praying? In that point, you become confused. But in the process, that's when you know there's something we normally do. We believe in spiritual cover. Every one of us in this place need one another. You need someone to lean on. When CJ, I could not lean on CJ anymore, and he could not lean on me. He knew that he had to take a higher step. That's by getting our spiritual cover. So at that point, we could not pray. We were upset with God. So we decided to get a spiritual cover and we called because we didn't want to lose the love of God. At that point, our spiritual cover started praying for us, even though they say something like, don't worry, Rita. Um, just know there's something I always remember. Actually, it was Pastor Kat and Pastor Ian that had to step in because God actually gave us that thing we always wanted, but he took it back. So I'm like, how can you give your child something and collect it back? It was so painful. CJ tried to encourage me. I said, no, God doesn't love me. Him to at a point, he started falling like... So at that point, he had to call Pastor Kat and Pastor Ian to step in. When they came in, they were speaking, but we were not actually listening. But the good thing is that what all the words they kept speaking in the night when we are alone or when we are in our quiet moment, the words keep ringing back. Something Pastor Kat says, she said, Rita, I want you to know that it's not your fault. I keep remembering that. She said, it's not your fault. There's nothing you did wrong. And you should know that God loves you. So I keep remember hearing those voices. And with that, I knew she kept praying for us. So that prayer kept us going. So everybody needs a spiritual cover you cannot handle waiting alone yeah, then the second thing you you need to understand is the love of god when you get to understand i think when they were praying for us then we went back to feeling that love that god has for us we we now decided to cast all our cares all our burden we laid them down we gave it to him because he said, let he who are weary and heaven laden come unto me and I will give you rest. Yeah. So we started using that scripture to pray. We were like, Father, Lord, we give you our pain. If you can die on the cross of Calvary for us so you can handle everything that concerns us. So we gave him everything. And at that point, we find rest. That's where Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 to 7 yeah, yeah. came in. I would like to read. Yeah. It said, do not be nothing. anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Next. And the peace of God. And the peace of God, which transcend, it means which passed all understanding, yeah. will guard your heart and your mind in Christ <clears throat> Jesus. Yeah. So that worked out for us. Now we are like at peace. Mm. We are like, take your time, Father Lord, whenever you are ready. <laughs> it's your problem, it's no longer our problem. Yeah, so. Yeah. We lay our body down. Why should I carry your body when you have carried it for me? Mm. So. Beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, my goodness, guys. 
Who could sit here and listen to these guys talk all day? <laughs> Both hands in the air. Um, I am really conscious that we're coming up on our time. Yeah. So I'd just love to ask you guys to pray for us. Who would love some of the spirit of prayer that God has placed on these guys in their own lives? Um, so I'd just love to invite us all. Maybe you want to close your eyes while you're seated and open your hands. And could you guys pray for us for a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit in prayer? Okay. And could you pray for us for a fresh hunger to stir up? And could you pray for us for whatever you feel led to pray for us for? Okay. We're so blessed by you guys. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, let's pray. Um, you know, just like Rita shared, um, when that day at the hospital, when the doctor declared that our child's, our baby's heart had stopped beating, Pastor Kat was there. It was like an experience that we didn't, we, we just wanted to reject it by all means, but it was real. Um, I don't know anyone here that feels you're probably going th through something all alone, a difficult situation, a rough patch. Um, I want you to realize that um, you don't have to allow the pain to drive you far away from God. Let your pain drive you closer to God. L look for a cover. Like, like Rita said, look for a spiritual cover. Um, the waiting process is a process you cannot go through alone. Just look for a cover. Um, I sense that God wants to raise a prayer of altar in somebody's life. Um, can we just pray differently? Um, can you just hold the hand of the person sitting beside you in agreement? And I need you to do something different. Um, just say a word of prayer for the person you're holding. Don't pray for yourself. Pray for the person you're holding. Um, I sense that God wants to raise an altar of prayer in somebody's life. God is preparing someone for a new phase, a new dimension, a new walk. And he's raising an altar of prayer in your, in your life. Um, you'd experience the Holy Spirit wake you up at different times to pray. You'd experience a new dimension, a fresh hunger for God. You'd experience um, a, a fresh connection with the Holy Spirit. He'd become more real to you. I need to pr pray in the Spirit if you can. Pray in tongues for the person you're holding. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everyone present. Thank you for our story. Thank you for the song you've put in our hearts. Thank you for everyone going through a phase. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you will comfort them with that comfort that comes from you. We pray that your love will be much more real in their hearts, we pray for a fresh encounter with you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we pray for as many as you're raising an altar of prayer in their lives. We pray, O oh Holy Spirit, the spirit of grace, the spirit of supplication, the spirit that partners with us. Scripture says we know not what we ought to pray as we ought to. But the Holy Spirit make it intercessions for us with groanings that are deep to be altered in human articulate wisdom. Let the river of your presence flood someone's life today. Let the river of your presence flood someone's hearts today. In the name of Jesus, that altar would receive the sacrifice of time, the sacrifice of a selfless heart, the sacrifice of love for God and love for man and love for our city. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Beautiful.
Beautiful. Thank you so much, Thank guys. You. Thank you. How much do we need each other's stories, hey? How much do we need to hear what we've all walked through with the Lord? And... Um, Guys, we cannot thank you enough for sharing all that you've shared with us today. I know we've scratched the surface. I know we've skipped over some bits there. Um, yeah, come and thank these guys after the service for what they've shared today. And we just pray God's covering over you guys. We know that when there's that opening up, um, you know, there can be some stuff that comes in to try and attack. But we just lift up the shield of faith with you. Um and we know that the name of the Lord is your strong tower. Yes. And to see what you guys have walked through and are witness to is just absolutely stunning. We are so blessed to have these guys part of our church community, aren't we? Let's stick around after the service. Let's hang out. Let's not talk about the weather. <laughs> Let's share our stories. Um, if you'd like to ask these guys to come and pray for you, I'm sure they would be absolutely honoured to. If you'd like to ask anyone else in the room to pray for you, I'm sure they'd be absolutely honoured to. Um, but let's hang out. Let's grab some amazing coffees or whatever you'd like to drink. Um, we'll be back here next Sunday. We'll be hearing more stories. We're going to be hearing from Caitlin and Rachel next week, which is going to be so powerful. So encourage you, invite someone. Like, How powerful is that be? <coughs> invite a friend along who needs to hear stories of Jesus at work in our lives. Um, we pray you have a blessed week, and we'll see you next Sunday. <laughs>